in scripture, let's turn to God, that our hearts and minds might be illuminated to hear the word. Let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, and silence any voice save yours, that hearing we may understand, and that understanding we may believe, and that believing we may do, and in doing we may be found to be your true children. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, I'd like to read the passage. Um, the theme for this whole service is God's authority, God's unlimited authority, and the remarkable direction that this gospel is taking is that that authority is going to land right on us. It's a truly incredible thing. It's as in, indescribable as the awe that we were singing about a little bit before. But right now, Jesus is in the temple. It's the Monday after Palm Sunday. And uh, there's some controversy stirring about. So listen to the text, and then we'll break it apart, and then we'll put it together with our lives, okay? This is from Matthew 21, and I'm reading from the 23rd to the uh, 32nd verse. When he entered the temple, the chief priests and elders of the people came to him as he was teaching. In other words, they interrupted him. And said, by what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? Jesus said to them, I will also ask you one question. If you tell me the answer, then I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven? Or was it of human origin? They argued with one another. If we say, from heaven, he will say to us, Why then did you not believe him? But if we say, of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for they all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And he said to them, then neither will I tell you by what authority I'm doing these things. What do you think? A man had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work in the vine vineyard today. And that son answered him, I will not. But later, he changed his mind and went. The father went to the second son and said the same. And he answers, I go, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of the father? And they said, the first. Then Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him. And even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe him. This ends the reading from God's holy word. God is always faithful to the hear, reading, the hearing, and the doing of the word. Well, let's, let's start the beginning and just work our way up a little slowly <clears throat> through this text. First, it is extremely important to get the chronology for this text. The first thing that happened was this, Palm Sunday. Jesus comes into the city, and according to the Gospel of Matthew, he makes quite an entrance. There are crowds before him and crowds behind him, and they're laying down their shirts and clothes on the street so that there's a paved road for Jesus to go smoothly on without picking up any dust. It's uh, They're singing Hosanna and the highest, and the chief priest and the uh, elders are not pleased. They enter Jerusalem, and according to Matthew's chronology, which is different from everyone else's, Matthew's chronology, Jesus goes immediately 
to cleanse the temple. He turns those tables upside down, announcing that God's temple, God's house, is a temple of prayer, not of money dealing. And in the outer courtyard, what was going on was not just a simple exchange of money for animals to be offered. What was going on out in that car, well, that courtyard, was really a fixed price system whereby the poorest could not even afford a little turn of that. It was a corrupt system. Jesus upsets the order that day, goes back to Bethany, comes back the next morning, and starts teaching. And right in the middle of his teaching, the chief priests and the elders approach him with this question. Now, their question is very simple. It is, where does your authority really come from? Now, authority in Greek has a beautiful ring to it because it's just like the word exit. It's exousia. It means from. Authority always implies a relationship. I don't have authority. I can't give myself authority. I did not have the authority to preach to you until you invited me and gave me that authority. Okay, I have authority as a pastor. I'm employable, but until somebody asks me, I don't have any authority. So they were asking, who do you report to? Now, what they knew is that they were in charge. It was the temple. These were the chief priests, and the elders. They were in charge of everything that happened in the temple. And being in charge of everything gave them a sense of power. Power in the New Testament is not the word for authority. Power is dunamis, and it's the word for force or energy. So we have two things that are blended together. What they're really wondering about is, does this man have any power? But they're asking the question about authority. And the reason why they're doing that is that they have confused it in themselves. They see themselves as powerful. But when Jesus came to earth, he gave all his power away. He could have done anything. He could have protected himself from anything. He could have had anything. But we read so beautifully and so clearly in Philippians that he emptied himself and became human. And in becoming human, he became the perfect child of God through whom God's power could always work. But it wasn't Jesus' power. He was authorized to live among us as one of us. His authority came from God and the only limits on that authority was the will of Jesus could not work contrary to the will of God. So the little question goes back and forth. And it's clear that our chief priests and elders in their little huddle are figuring out what danger there is associated with this man, Jesus. If it's just the rabble, you know, the ones who are so far off to the edge, the untouchables, then there's not much to worry about. But do you know why they really got upset? It's actually just a little bit before in the uh, 15th verse, when the chief priests and scribes saw the amazing things that he did and listened to this, 
and heard the children singing Hosanna in the highest. Isn't that odd that that got them upset? The fact that children were singing, that meant that the rising generation was looking at Jesus and saying something to be celebrated. And so maybe there really was some power related to this man. Well, Jesus was very, very clear with them in the story, and they even got the story, and they didn't like it one bit. So that's, that's our text. There's one more word that we should pick out. And I had to read through about five translations, and none of them said it the way I wanted it, the way it should be said, the way that would be the most clear. And I think it's because in English we maybe don't have this word. You might want to think about it and see if your languages that you know have it a little bit better. In English, we often talk about changing our minds. But the Greek word that's here is metamelomia, metamelomia, and meta means as in metamorphosis. It, it, that is the changing part. But the melomia is not to change my mind, but to change what I care about. To change what I care about. So it implies how I act towards you, not how I think about you. So it's a huge difference in the text. And it, it just does not, there's no way to really say that as clearly in English. So that one word that it's always translated changing a mind, it's really changing your affections, your actions, what you care to give yourself to. Okay, so now let's try and put this a little bit into our everyday lives. You know, the philosopher Voltaire said that you should judge a person not by how much they know, but what kinds of questions they ask. And I have a feeling that he would, he'd been reading the Gospel of Matthew because Jesus was always kind of observing what the questions people were asking really were. And specifically, Jesus was trying to figure out and knew in an instant whether any question put to him was an honest question or one of those. So, uh, Jesus, if you answer this question, I'll know I'm right. One of those kind of questions. Or perhaps the, uh, Jesus, here's a question I bet you can't answer. Oh, you know, that's a fun game that people love to play with clergy, by the way. I never understood. Blah, 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 blah. Well, it's ununderstandable. Okay, that's why you didn't understand it. Well, it's indescribable. It can't get broken down into small enough pieces for you to understand. So that's why it's in there. It's called a mystery. But Jesus looked, listened to questions, hoping to see the attitude of a person's soul. You know, one commentary made this of shocking suggestion that were, there were really only two honest questions asked of Jesus in the Gospels. One is the rich young man who came wanting to know what he must do in order to have an eternal life. And the other, oddly, is Pilate right before he washes his hands and he looks at Jesus and says, what then is true? Almost every other question posed to Jesus is self-serving or has a hidden agenda. And certainly that's true for this particular question that the, the chief priests and the elders are doing. Most people are just too full of themselves to be empty enough to really ask Jesus a heartfelt question. So the scribes and the Pharisees say, who gave you this uh, authority? And clearly, they were worried. They were worried, but it, and it comes out in their question. You know, they don't have any real power. They're an occupied nation. 
in the temple courtyard, they're in charge. But who's in charge of them? We would like it to be Rome. But it's Rome. Rome gives them permission to be a priest. Rome gives them permission to keep peace during the high holy days. And when children start singing, Hosanna to a man riding a donkey into a city, the chief priests and elders were very nervous. So, of course, they questioned his authority. Now, they only worry about one relationship, and that's their relationship with Rome. But what they were also concerned about was if there was something about Jesus' relationship with these poor outcasts, these tax collectors and prostitutes that he's known for hanging around with, if there's something about that relationship that has some power, particularly when they heard the children singing. Now, they could tell that Jesus did not operate from a position of power. You cannot look powerful and ride a donkey if you're a grown man. Right? Your feet are going to be dragging in the dust. You cannot look dignified. If you want to look powerful, you ride a horse, like the Romans do. Right? You do not ride a donkey. So they, they, they were pretty sure that he had no claims to power, but they were beginning to suspect that there was something more that was going on. They come to him. They challenge him. He asks them a question back, which should have been very simple to understand, but no. They claim they can't answer that question because, well, quite frankly, because it's a spiritual question. It's not related to the social structure that they live in. Rome doesn't play into it at all, and that's what they're worried about. So, when people can't get the conversation on a logical level. Jesus always does one thing. He tells a story. And this particular story that he tells is sort of classic first century storytelling. Once upon a time, there was a man who had two sons. Okay? First century, ear, ear, and ear, ears, God, the Father, two sons, and it's set up always for there to be a good son and a bad son. And guess what? The good son is always Israel, and the bad son is everybody else. Okay? That's just how they hear everything. The good son always does, always says, holds his father in absolute <clears throat> respect. This is a little hard for us who have homes that we can go to and be distant from our neighbors and don't live our lives in public. But in a first century Palestinian village, if you had A, no windows in those openings in your house, B, most of your life was lived in the courtyard, outside where people were walking by to actually look in and see what's going on and guess what everybody knew everything that was going on so if you so much as said to your father no i'm not going to do that you would have publicly humiliated your father and quite frankly for a son to humiliate his father particularly the first son, the first born son, which this first probably implies, particularly the first born son to say, no, not doing it, don't want to go to the lake fields today, was such a um, face, a loss of face for that man, that he would literally have to stay away from society until punish that son appropriately. And the punishment could have been the severest sending him away. The second son does the right thing. Right? All you have to do is say, yes, daddy. That's all you have to do, and everything's fine. 
Except it's not really fine, is it? Because there was something more that the father wanted. He needed some help out in the field that day. He needed his sons to go. So one changes his affection, changes what he cares about, and goes out to the field, while the other one stays with just, I'll always do what you ask me to do, but doesn't move. Now, we all get that. Even the scribes and the Pharisees get it, but they didn't find what they got. Because they knew that the first son who said no was sinning against his father. And they also knew that the second son, who didn't follow through on his word, was sinning against his father. Neither of these sons were truly righteous in the father's eyes. But one of them did the father's will. So as they're kind of scratching their heads and feeling like this is coming back to haunt them, it indeed did come back to haunt them, but not in that easy way. Now here's the easy way to understand this lesson. Oh yeah, I get it. Actions speak louder than words. That's absolutely true. Actions do speak louder than words. But this parable is not about that easy connection. This parable is about changing the way one behaves. Changing what one cares about. Moving away from having myself as the center of the universe to realizing that, oh, my father was asking me to go into the fields because he needed help. And because he needs help, I'll go. It's a relationship that, ch that is changing. So Jesus, and this is where the authority comes in, that where the authority that will link us to the disciples come in. When we are the kind of people who really want to be alive, who really want to care about the things that God cares about, who really want to do God's will in our everyday lives, then we're going to be standing here with hungry hearts, with open minds, and wills or affections that are willing to change. You know, Jesus really did not want all the words that people told him. A lot of what people said to Jesus, he would have preferred silence. He did not lay long theological explanations on things. Jesus wanted honest questions from people. He didn't like quick answers. He seemed to have delighted in confusion. And all those memorized verses that the scribes and the Pharisees could recite were less interesting to Jesus than the one word, help. Jesus wants men and women, little kids who learn to sing songs, and grandpas and grandmas who can't do as much as they used to do. He wants there all those kind of people who take changing their affections seriously, who say about their own lives, not my will, but yours, especially when they figure out what I've figured out, what many of you are figuring out, that is that you have to do that changing daily. It's a practice. It's moving out of center stage and allowing God to move into center stage when we really start to consider this.
God's words in the Gospel of Matthew. You may remember that. And if you don't, I'll read it to you. Jesus looked at his, this is the risen Lord speaking to his disciples. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. Now listen, this is got to be pretty amazing. Right? They're barely standing up right. They're so grieved over Jesus. They're slightly refer, uh, encouraged by his resurrection, but he's about to ascend. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I commanded you. And what did Jesus command them? Love one another as I have loved you. Love one another. That's the authority we've been given. We've been given the authority to ask, how can I do that? And know that we can't, that God will. And all we really need to do is get out of the way and allow Christ's love to live in us. As Christ followers, we are filled with the same unlimited that Christ was there for. We're to make disciples. We're to invite people into a relationship filled with honest questions and countless changes of not just changes.